You are about to see Pancho Ramos Sierle and Jonathan Ute speaking on urban permaculture at the UCSC Kresge Town Hall on Thursday, January 29th, 2015. The event was hosted by the Kresge Common Ground Center, Education for a Just and Sustainable World. For more information, visit kresge.ucsc.edu backslash common ground. How many of you were here in the, in the morning of the other class? Two minutes. One minute. Um, well, some of you have already heard this, but many of you don't know me. But I would like you to know that I love you all. Who knows if this is going to be the last time that we're going to make contact and share space time. So, I just wanted to know that. And one of the practices that we do in, in Casa de Paz, Casa de Paz is one of the five houses there in the Canada Farm. Uh, there's a lot of structural violence and physical violence going on there. Uh, it's in East Oakland and Fruitvale. And uh, we need to take care of the inner ecology, the inner community. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a, a five minutes of uh, uh, wonderful receptive silence. But first, uh, please raise your hand if in the last week you washed your hands. And look around. It's like, hey, people, hands up. Wonderful. <coughs> Please raise your hand if in the last 24 hours you went to the bathroom to pee or poo. Mm -hmm. There's no place to pee. Okay. <laughs> now, please raise your hand if in the last 24 hours you washed your mind. Look at that. There's so many hands in there. So why don't we do it, you know, with all these, like, corporate media and all these horrible news is coming and the warming up of the planet and the violence and the, oh, in order to be happy, you need to have this and that and the, no, oh, that's so good. So, we're going to anchor in five minutes of, so we want to wait, one way to anchor ourselves is in silence, could be contemplation, walking in the woods, uh, looking at the stars or silent prayer or meditation, or we just call this a brain exercise, just focusing our attention into so let's just do five minutes. I want to buy the bell. You know, so they're comfy, not too comfy, they'll be full sleep. Yeah. Um, that's great. Close your eyes gently. <coughs> and we're going to focus our attention on our breathing. How the air comes in. How it goes up. And where my mind want to wonder and we hear noises and things that we need to do, but we'll try to be still and see how if we can even just pay attention to the air when it comes in through our nostrils. Relax our legs and arms and shoulders and feel more calm with each breath. Thank you. This is part of, we need to have a mechanism, especially when you're living in the sea, to how to deal with the compost, inner compost. You know, there's a lot of things that we need to process. So just a brief story. Um, <coughs> I don't know, well, uh, we had a, a friend that came and stayed in, in Casa de Paz. We were in East Oakland. And, uh, we don't close the door ever. Or the door is so locked all the time because we want this place to be available to anybody. The neighbors, so we have a brother that at that point he was a Buddhist monk. American Buddhist monk in his 30s, and every day after uh, we have an hour of the sacred signs in the morning and in the evening. So in the mornings, 
you want how it was going through these long walks, uh, going from 35th Avenue all the way to the freeway, like five miles, and coming back. And this is a kind of person that doesn't blend into the background. Right? It's an American Buddhist mom, uh, white with brown rose, student of Thich Nhat Hanh, and uh, well, he's coming back. And then two uh, youth just yell at him like, "Hey, man!" And he just turns around and says, "Yes." He's like, Are you a Buddhist monk? And I'm like, "Yes, I am." He's like, "You're hella peaceful, man." <laughs> and he's like, "Well, that's what I'm trying to do." And so we say that it is so easy to bring peace to the world, as easy as just walking on the sidewalk. But what is very challenging is to be the peace of the world. But how many hours these brothers spend with that inner compass so to be radiating peace, to be, to be that, that love that he's not talking about peace or anybody, he's just having peace, what she just looked like. So we call that kind of a presence activism. So we have here also another uh, presence activism. Farming too. Oh, yes, we hope you like farming. 
We hope you like farming, cause we want to farm with you. Yeah! Integrate rather than segregate. 
when I think about the curriculum that we're in right now, collaborative learning, that principle is just throughout. So often in our education system, we're siloed across divisions. I love that word, divisions, academic divisions. We really are divided. And so in college courses, we can integrate rather than segregate and turn towards each other instead of always facing forward the whole time. Use small and slow solutions. Use and value diversity. Use edges and value the marginal. Creatively use and respond to change. So those are some of the principles. There's a whole lot more. I love the problem is the solution. That's one of those attitudinal principles, you know, to shift our thinking. And I could go on and on about permaculture. I taught a, a five unit class that Kevin was in last year for a whole quarter. Um, so just know that there's a whole lot more here, and the class in the spring, the theme of the whole quarter for collaborative learning is permaculture skills and transition talents. So we're going to be, you know, practicing permaculture the whole time. And today is a day to kind of think about urban sustainable communities and as a site for applying these permaculture principles in our own lives right here in California. That's it. Thank you. Um, I like how you said that we're in this industrial world society we're taught to be thinking separately and isolated. And so that's the problem. We don't know how connected we are. We're, we don't know how we're harming those connections. And how are we going to create a regenerative, uh, <coughs> a life regenerative society moving from industrial world society to a regenerative So that flat and the back, uh, when I do my bike or uh, walking, people love it. I call it also not the earth flat, but the smiles flat. It's all I like your friend. Well, first is not my flat, it's our flat. It's like, so what is it uh, that an astrobiologist, I went to, to UC Berkeley uh, and I was in the graduate program finding Earth-like planets. And uh, so how did I move from the astronomy department to Fruitvale? You know, still, what, what happened there? Well, um, I uh, was wanted to bring that holistic perspective. So as a, uh, it was the fourth year of, of my PhD, and then this one, the administration of Brother George Bush and Los Alamos and Liverpool Labs are uh, from the right and left arm of the University of California made the first official announcement since the end of the Cold War that they were building the new set of nuclear weapons. So I said, well, um, I'm a scientist. I'm not against science. I'm against the unethical applications of science. So it doesn't matter that I need one year to get my PhD or one second. I don't want to receive a title from an institution that is putting at risk the survival of other species. So we did a lot of, uh, but we don't want to exacerbate the fractures either. So many of us start noticing that it is impossible to do this work by yourself. Mm -hmm. So we want to really live in an integral, non-violent way from the thoughts we have, the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the words we say, the things we do. And so I'll say, well, let's, let's, let's live together. And so we started with uh, Casa de Paz, and then later became part of the Canticle Farming. Basically, in this place, I think, is that you cannot hide from all the, the structural violence and the collapsing of the system of a thing oriented society. We want to move to a people oriented society. So we remove all the fences. Uh, now there's five houses from right there. We say uh, we are a platform of the great turning. And what is the great turning? Again, is, is this moving from an uh, uh, industrial world society to a uh, regenerative, uh, life sustaining society, uh, life regenerative society? And so we say we're going to do it one heart at a time, one home at a time, one block at a time. Mm. Period. We stop. So um, I'm going to show you um, the video. Yeah. And just so you know, like how does it fit up with this with the earth like uh, with the flag, is that it is awesome that for the first time in human history, we have a catalog of earth like planets. 
And so we earthlings are kind of having this sleeping consciousness. Joanna Macy, she talks about the great turning of the three dimensions for this to happen. The first one is to hold actions. When there's a, something that we don't want to see happening, so you can go and disobey the great love to stop the worst of damage. For this, she said, this is not enough. We need to create alternatives. All this part of the culture, all the things that inspire people, that, well, yeah, we're against this, but what are you for? And there's a lot of stuff. Most of our energy needs to be there in having these kind of classes and discussions. And then the third one is the shift in consciousness. So this, my beloved brothers and sisters, this is a shift, a tremendous shift in consciousness because now we can see this, this catalog of earth like planets and think, oh wow, it doesn't matter what country, what religion, what sexual orientation, what matters is to be a responsible citizen of the world. So now every time that you can see this flag, you see the earth is but one country and all the means are citizens. We don't need passports and secret visas. We want to do a bonfire with them and we want Santa G. We're in a crossroads. If you study history, that word that you did has been used frequently. Often we are at the crossroads at the precipice. What is different about the crossroads we face today? Well, of course it's true that every human existential decision has carries great weight. And there have been other moments in our journey of humanity when everything seemed to say that it could be the end of the world. Surely the end of the first millennium, during the Black Plague in Europe. I think the difference now is that we have the technology to, for the first time, to view the whole planet, to put, to pick up the rhythms, to to, we can see the preparations for war. We can see the effects of desertification. We can count and figure that what's happening in the disappearance of the species. So because of what we are able to know, thanks to our technology, we are in the uh, awkward and horrifying position of being able to watch the falling away of life. And, what I call, along with the economists, very important, the great unraveling that's uh, occurring now. So we're at a crossroads where we can see what we, what story do we want to get behind? Do we want to get behind the story of the industrial growth society? Those are the voices we mostly hear from our politicians and military and corporate heads. Or do we want to uh, just stand transfixed before the great unraveling, a second story, or there's a third story. And that's the story of a transition to a life-sustaining society. Uh, you can call it a lot of things, ecological revolution, sustainability revolution, and a lot of us are just calling it the great turning. Let's give this a wonderful opportunity to turn to a video sequence that was shot of some work that you do. Yeah, it's called The Work That Reconnects. I had the pleasure to visit Joanna recently at a community center in East Oakland where she teaches and leads workshops. Chemical Farm was created when five houses on this one city block agreed to take down their backyard fences to create a single community garden. Chemical Farm trains local youth and even gang members in organic gardening, then donates the harvested fruit and vegetables to neighbors in need. Parte de eso es un regalo completamente um, desinteresadamente. Es dado con todo el corazón, con nuestra alma, esperando que tengan un buen guiso en su casa para compartir la familia. En realidad, para mí significa ya más amistad y más familia, porque ya nos conocemos, ya nos ayudamos y es algo bien bonito que ahora ya no nada más son estas casas que podemos mirar, sino ya es familia, ya es comunidad. <laughs> Well, she is always talking about the great trend in Iran, but it is uh, we're moving from uh, industrial growth society, uh, 
pollution, violence-based economy and system, how do we move to a life-sustaining civilization, to a system that is based on love and courage and compassion and generosity? Y esto es igual de la misma familia de la Because, because this is uh, rooted in Franciscan St. Francis, and you know of the latest thing that he last that he did in his life at the time of his death, as he was feeling abandoned by his hopes in a way, he lay there and wrote the Canticle of the Sun in gratitude for life. Mm -hmm. So we're making a place here that we can feel glad for life and glad and grateful for the promise of life. So, okay, what, is, what did you tell Brother Hermano Esteban? What did you tell him? Why are you here? I come here to eat the good fruit and stuff. Uh -huh. what, what were you eating? What were you eating 30 minutes ago? Are you asking for the night when you were cutting it? I was eating cabbage. Cabbage? Wow! And raw cabbage? Yeah. What's sacred to you about cattle farms? It's a ripening of the promise of Francis, <laughs> and it's a ripening of the promise of our humanity <laughs> in a place that has been. I mean, here. Uh, in the night, for example, there were gunshots heard again, drive-by shootings, uh, people pushed to the edge. And right here, it is right in the place of uh, danger and suffering where the human spirit can open its eyes and, and try. Uh, this is very uh, so this is hyper-local organic history. It still remembers the tree. Tony, it remembers the tree. I love that. Yeah. Uh, Nithya, the uh, Nithya, the Kia Sagrado. Sagrado es todo. Todo. Los niños son sagrados. La naturaleza es sagrada. Es el respeto que um, juega con varios eh, factores de valores. And some of us here, like at Elijah, are living on the gift economy, and that's the future too. It's part of it. Mm -hmm. It's part of the future. A broad realm of, it, of exchange and of gifting, mm -hmm. because we try and transition out of this simply exchange-based economy. Life's a gift. Life is a gift. And there's real needs. So how do we balance them both, especially in this time of transition? <laughs> Any songs that can have one catch Yes, yes. <laughs> That's right. And there is St. Francis hiding there. He prays all brother, son, and sister, and woman. He prays all the creatures of earth. He prays as you come and find your peace together. Here in this place, you know, where there's a, a lot of times uh, that we say we look for the light, not for the light, and that's what we're trying to I was saying that this in this place, in the same way that when St. Francis was dying, was kicked out from his community. Uh, well, we say here, you know, in this, there's a lot of violence. We look for the light, not the fight. So, uh, and one of the most radical or uh, revolutionary ways, from my point of view. To, uh, to be this day and age is to survey the market. So what we do is have a, a gift to college and kind of farmer's market there where we get organic food because people have access to guns and drugs and prostitution but they don't have access to organic food. So we just do bitters and give it as a gift. So this kind of, uh, a little bit of what we live in and we're gonna go to the place. Well, 
Currently, I can't help but see the ozone layer is decreasing greatly. With global warming, there's a lot to be concerned about the rising temperatures. This country needs to learn about the choices that we make and the things that we use. We need to pay attention lest we simply lose that special thing about Earth, supporting all life. But our petroleum economy only seems to bring on strife. So my name's Jonathan, and uh, that was a little poem that was part of a uh, puppet show about uh, biofuel that may have actually been performed here about 10 years ago. Um, and it still rings true. Um, part of what motivated us in creating the place for sustainable living was the need to bring um, this awareness to urban dwellers around how to live uh, more ecologically sane. Um, so, I'll just tell you a little bit about place. Um, here's some photos up here. It's a, it's a 10,000 square foot uh, spot in northwest Oakland. It has a, a barn in one corner. It has a shop where we have a, a fab lab, which is a fabrication laboratory for um, appropriate technology. Um, and we also have a, um, a whole tiny home eco-village. So there's about six trailers on the property and everyone who is living on the property pays a little bit of rent but also volunteers 10 hours a week and stewards a area, a focus. So some of those areas would be events, uh, education, the facility itself, um, buzz, which is sort of marketing and promotion, um, programs, which is both developing new programs and running existing programs. So everyone who's there is actually, you know, committed to volunteering to, to making some aspects of this happen. Um, the, the main sort of institution that we sort of like em embrace is uh, urban permaculture and wanting to create a showcase for urban permaculture. And um, what is exactly does that mean? Well, you know, we have a vertical, a vertical um, garden going up on a wall. You know, this is an example of you're in a city, you don't have a lot of space. What can you do? How can you utilize available resources? Uh, build up, you know. As well as building up, uh, we're also exploring the notion of building out. And so, to that effect. We're basically working with our neighbors. Uh, this is the church across the street, and we're doing uh, edible food, planting trees, grapevines, uh, you know, greens, what have you, um, as well as uh, this is a, a place of, uh, of sitting and repose. So this is a cob bench that's going in right on our corner, but we're also working with other neighbors and seeing what are other ways that we can um, engage in placemaking, which is uh, sort of like a reimagining and revisioning of public spaces in between private places. Um, so this is something that's ongoing. The, uh, the barn that you saw in the earlier photo is a spot both for uh, classes, workshops, skill shares. It also serves as the common house for our eco-village. So everyone has their little dwelling, but then the barn is where we make food, is where we have a living room, is where uh, we have a dining room, we have, um, you know, that transforms into a, a public venue for classes, workshops, events. We have a stage uh, as well, so we are really trying to mix arts and ecology. The, the name PLACE is actually an acronym for people linking art, community, and ecology. And so the idea of, you know, fusing all of those uh, together in one one realm is uh, really crucial. Having fun while we do it, you know, because uh, who was it? The Emma Emma Goldman was saying, "If I can't dance, I don't want to be part of the revolution." So we really have to model that and have fun as we do it. So edutainment is really a big part of it. That's why you know it was appropriate to to bring a little example of edutainment to sort of help captivate uh, the spirit of uh, what we what we stand for. Um, in addition to the, see, the fab lab, which is like the appropriate technology. Now, what is appropriate technology? Who here has heard that term before? 
appropriate technology. So appropriate technology is whatever whatever is appropriate for the area, for the region, for the for the system that you're working in. So if you're in a sunny area, you, solar would be an appropriate technology. If you're in a windy area, you know windmills would be appropriate. Um, we have people that are tinkering with all of these different realms, and we also have uh, you know things like gas fires where we're making electricity out of burning um, walnut shells and. Um, this is, you know, I, this is ideal for situations where you don't have fuel delivery. If you're in a remote location, or if uh, uh, a big disaster happens and you don't have, you know, trucks delivering gas, you have biomass, and it is basically a, a biogas. Um, we also have uh, rocket stoves. Rocket stoves are a really efficient way to burn uh, scrap wood, and then we we actually heat up um, a, a series of stove pipes that are embedded in a cob. Bench. Now, cob is just like a natural concrete, but it's made out of sand, straw, and clay, like adobe. So that is what heats our barn. We, we burn wood scraps from the shop, and uh, it's, it's the most efficient way to burn. It burns like one-tenth of the rate of a normal sort of uh, stove. So these are models and examples that are, that are all throughout our, our system. We also have a uh, greenhouse that is basically uh, built off of our barn, and it is facing the south. So you enclose it, and it heats up. You put a vent in the top of the greenhouse and a vent in the bottom, and convection is what heats the barn. It takes the heat from the greenhouse. It's like, oh, where do I got to go? I'm going to go higher. So it goes to the vent, and it goes into the, into the barn. So we are heating our barn during the day with the greenhouse that's mounted on the side. And that's a form of passive solar. It's just hanging out passively. It's not active. So it's a passive solar design. So this is another example. So people come to an event or a class, but then they see all these things and they're like, oh, whoa, oh, whoa, oh. there's, there's signage and information as well as the, 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 the workshops and skill shares. So people are, they might have come for a poetry reading or a film presentation. Barn dance. Or a barn dance, a boot nanny. Um, but, uh, but then they're exposed to these green technologies. And that's the idea of what this center is. And so it's not only an eco village, which you've heard about last a week or two, uh, but it is an eco-village with the purpose of serving. We are in service, in the same way the Hansville Farms is in service to their community, we are in service to our extended community as well. And everyone who lives there has that ethos of working and volunteering to serve. Um, so in addition to the Fab Lab, we have something called the Makery. The Makery is like a bakery for makers. And so it's a shared art space. So our idea that you know art is in, is got to be part of the solution uh, is is allows for you know creative sort of interpretation of some of these um, types of green technologies. So it's really crucial to have a spot for artists to work. And in addition, it's a shared space. So instead of paying three hundred dollars for your <coughs> private studio, you're paying fifty dollars, seventy five dollars for the use of uh, space in this makery. So. Um, in addition to the makery, we have a huge yard, and, and so around the outside and perimeter of the yard are the trailers, but we also have uh, pallet planters. Now you take a pallet, and everywhere you go is a pallet. You find them on the streets of Oakland, everywhere. We don't buy anything. So we put this pallet down, we put some, um, uh, we build these wicking beds. We're in a drought situation, okay? Wicking beds is like, you know, you have a, a, a oil lamp. Right? You have this reservoir of oil, you have a wick, and then it burns. Okay, in the same way, we have a reservoir of water, and then, and then it sort of evaporates up into the soil. And then the, the roots of the plants are planted up top, and they basically look for and find the moisture by growing down. So you get stronger root system. You don't get the evapotranspiration, which happens when it's top water. Right? In top water, half of it or more, 75% of the water evaporates. So in a drought situation, We've got these things called wicking beds that are made on pallets. Now we have, you know, they're, they're all over the yard, but if we ever want to do a big event like a barn dance, what we do is we have um, a pallet jack or a forklift uh, that basically brings them out into the street. So basically when you arrive at an, at an event, if it was a big event that we warranted removing the pallet planters, we will literally walk down the street and the street will just be nothing but crops. It'd just be boxes of crops. No cars. And so, again, you're surrounded. It's like a, an immersive environment. And so that's another sort of, uh, sort of concept that we're like working towards is 
How do we find ways to grow anywhere we can, whether it's on the wall, whether it's on you know, this like pallet that can go out into the street. You know, these concepts of parklets is a big uh, thing. It's another type of place-making project where it's going into the commons. It's creating a little mini parklet. Uh, we're doing farmlets with these pallet panels. Um, so in addition to uh, that, we have a greenhouse where we're doing starts and we're going to be developing um, a uh, program for uh, teens, a seed to start program that basically grows, uh, starts from seeds and then um, a bike trailer, we have a bike trailer that will deliver them to farmers markets. And it'll be sort of like a green entrepreneurship program and also learn how to grow food. And we've been targeting the youth that are in the immediate area. We have a number of public housing projects in our neighborhood and those will be the first ones that we would approach. Um, and partnering with that would be a group called Planting Justice. Planting Justice is a group that teaches uh, garden education in prisons and schools, but um, they hire people out of prison and uh, to do their landscape um, design and installation <coughs> business. Um, and so they're from the neighborhood and they also go into schools and work with the kids and say, hey, you know, I was in the joint, you don't want to go into the joint you know, learn this gardening thing, it's taking care of me now, it can take care of you too. And so the kids are listening because these are guys from that neighborhood that are basically, you know, appealing to the kids saying, come on, don't get into trouble, keep your head out of it, and, you know, stay, stay true to the nature way. Okay. Right, exactly. So they are going to be, we're partnering with them. Um, and then finally, you know, the, I, I referenced it uh, briefly, but the placemaking, you know, city repair up in Portland, Oregon is a big inspiration for us. Um, it, it effectively forces neighbors to reach out and talk to each other. And by talking to each other, they help, you know, create a vision for how the neighborhood wants to grow. And so what does that mean? Well, that means front yard gardens. It means uh, benches and planters, uh, plant, planter boxes. It means public art. And so, um, you know, a lot of neighbors don't have the capacity. So they don't even, they're not even thinking, oh, let me just uh, institute a barn raising where I get 20 people out here to do this garden in my front yard. But we mentioned that this is what we do and it's what we want to do and we have a whole slew of people that are willing to do it. We have the tools and the know-how and the desire and passion to do it. So if you want a garden in your front yard, just say so. And then on this one day, we have a Creating the Commons Festival where uh, everyone comes out, we have booths, everything, almost everything free. Um, we have food, we have um, a stage, and then we do these placemaking projects all up and down the street. And this is where everyone starts to come together and recognize, wow, we are a community, and we are now in, in greater touch with each other than we were before. And as a result, you know, you have places to sit down and hang out with your neighbors, and that builds a, a strong sense of, of, of awareness and of security because everyone knows each other now. And before, they were hiding in their homes and afraid. And so this sort of forces people to get out and come and meet your neighbor. So the, I guess Mark Blakeman's coming in a week or so. He'll talk at length about that. But that's another thing that we're very much uh, sort of into and helping bring forth into the East Bay uh, is the placemaking concept. So, yeah. I love how you mentioned Mark Lakeman coming next week yeah, to our class. Mark's actually going to be here next Thursday in our class, and then the next day, Friday, we're doing the first Friday at the Museum of Art and History downtown. Every first Friday of the month, there's a big community-wide celebration in downtown Santa Cruz. And Mark's going to be keynoting at the sort of central fire of first Friday at the mall with John Young and Nina Simon and a bunch of other people, so that's not to be missed. The next day, we are doing a workshop with Pika, and then the next day we're planting the first community orchard at a park in Santa Cruz, at Riverside Garden Park. The first public orchard is happening on Sunday, and we're just going to be there for the dedication as well. Wow. So a whole thing. So I love you mentioning Mark because it shows that we're in community together. Um, and also in your slides, I can see the set, a UCSC alumni. Oh yeah. I saw Pandora Thomas yep. in there, another permaculture teacher. So. Really, we're inviting you into this community to the extent that you would like to be engaged in this sort of Bay Area permaculture, sustainable community realm. Um, as you can tell, this is, this is real. There's jobs. Um, there's plenty of good work to, to do in the future. Indeed. There's a story that you were reminding that we have been very exciting that I really wanted to share. Um, it started 
there was a, an apartment complex right by Casa Bus, a mechanical farm. There's like maybe 200 people living there, 50 families, and there's this grass and all this lawn there. It was full of trash and cigarette butts and alcohol bottles and dog poop. And so uh, we talked with the neighbors. Part of what John was saying, of how do we grow out? So he was talking with his neighbor, uh, Maurelio, and he's like, yeah, uh, I'm just going to put a pepper plant there. So he put a hot pepper plant in, in this home, and he was watering it from his bathroom. So he put like a hose coming from his bathroom and started watering this plant. And then he put two plants. And then we said, oh, okay. so we have a workshop where we put 17 fruit trees there, and apples, and uh, loquas, and apricots, and plums, and cherries. Now, the whole thing after almost two years is totally transformed. And those are kind of our volunteers, and now it's scientifically proven, not that science needed to, to do it, but uh, the greener a neighborhood is, the more peaceful it mm -hmm. We have these 24 7 volunteers, and people just like uh, taking care of the trees and doing that. Um, and we, so every time that we see an empty lot there in Oakland, we're trying to do that. And so sometimes we succeed, sometimes the city comes and bulldoze. But we have like horror stories of having an avocado tree after we put 110 cubic yards of mulch and horse manure. We have flowers, and then the city comes and bulldoze. We didn't have my city strong for the community, so we have to wait. Uh, and I have another story, a successful story, but it comes after this. Yes. So, you know, talking about sustainable communities and sustainable urban communities. You know, the two, you know, physical spaces that we have that people live at is one way to look at community and sustainable community. But we also wanted to touch on, you know, the importance of uh, the sort of the uh, ecosystem that can support and be supportive of, of communities. And to that effect, you know, there's countless other nonprofit groups that are based there. So you know, there's some of them that are focused on urban ag, like the Biofuel Oasis. They, they do biofuel, but they also have an urban farm store. There's a group called Urban Adama, which is a Jewish group that does uh, a, a urban garden um, sort of a semester. It teaches everyone about, um, you know, all these issues. Um, there's City Slicker Farms that basically helps people garden in their own front and backyard. Um, and then takes some of the harvest and shares it, and then leaves some of the harvest for the house that it's based at. Um, and we're starting to like work together into like a mycelial network. And so we literally are calling it like a mycelial network, and um, starting to reach out and find out like how can we be of support? Can we plan our calendars together so we all have to offer a B class on the same day? Um, are there are there resources that are in the community like the trucks? that are available to each of these groups and spaces and co-op houses and, and, um, and eco-villages and what have you. These are ways that we can start to see sustainable community outside of you know, a, a dwelling. So to that effect, we wanted to just uh, show you this one thing, Omni Commons. Has anyone heard of the Omni? Okay, so the Omni Commons is, uh, is a, the newest sort of, uh, it's, it's, it's basically an Occupy camp that went indoors. And they secured a 22,000 square foot building. It was an Italian American uh, sort of uh, social club. And it is now home to uh, a variety of things that we felt like was important enough to show you in the realm of sustainable communities. So, you want to roll that? Hot Lux, concerts, plays. ready to open to the public. There's code, permits, making sure that we're accessible to everyone. We need your help in order to do that. The best part is, if we raise enough money, we could eventually buy a building, which would mean Omni could be around for years to come, and it could grow with Oakland. But Omni's not just for work and projects. yoga, and dance. And we're even working with the Icarus Project, a radical mental health community. Here at Omni, we believe that health and wellness is an important aspect of community. We want to make that more accessible to Oakland. There's a lot of things going on here. We 
Coconut Bonds is also here, and they've been helping serve free food to the hungry since 1980. Yeah. So when you're not working, dancing, cooking, like I'm just gonna come on into La Comune Cafe, it's a collectively owned coffee shop and bookstore. make it happen without the support of people like you. Thanks for coming. Hope to see you again soon. Or something just to agricultural purposes. 
From that 110 acres, they're left on 10. Because they're continuously developing more and more. The last thing that we knew a few years ago is that they wanted to build a Whole Foods and put a, a center for uh, elder people that they have to pay $4,000 a month to leave there. So we got organized. This, this, this is not happening. Because people have been trying to have an urban farm for 30 years there. And so this for me was the Occupy 2.0 because there's the obstructive program of the non-violent civil disobedience and protest and, and boycott. They said, well, Whole Foods, are you going to do that? Um, so, and we, you cannot imagine how much we bother those guys that uh, Whole Foods said, like, okay, we, we're pulling out. And they pull out. Well, they bring another uh, corporation. So you would still be okay, what is this all about? But it's a beautiful way to put together that joy that is so beautiful. We have, uh, I don't know if you, the trailer says, but we planted 15,000 seedlings in one day. 300 people there, we have children and elders. It was so, one of the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful non that I've done ever in my life. You know, it was full of joy. So it's just kind of the contrast what the collapsing system we're working with here.
And there's the, the movie's out there, so uh, you can go watch it. It's pretty inspiring. And uh, I don't know how we're doing time-wise, but I think there's, uh, I don't know. Let's work for that.
I mean, there's a lot of creativity and love in spaces like these to continue um, this sort of revolution in the human spirit. And before we get into the question Q and A, I just wanted to add that the Gill track, which is what this uh, track of uh, land is, it was actually deeded to the university. The university is a land grant uh, college. It's it dedicated. And I think. I think this you see is too on some level, Davis for sure. It, it has to do agriculture. And so that property was never supposed to be sold off. And it did get some, some of it did. There's 20 acres in total, 10 acres were saved and preserved and transferred from the College of Capital, which wanted to sell it to Whole Foods, to the College of Natural Resources for 10 years, which is a great victory. But then there's the other 10 acres. And so right now, a lot of the student groups and the guild track and Occupy the Farm folks are actually not letting 10 acres uh, be satisfactory. They are actually going after the full 20 acres. So there is action. There is um, um, definitely um, more work to be done. And uh, we are in the process of, of, of developing a uh, both um, a neighborhood-based, community-based, and, and, and UC-supported uh, educational farm project there. And it's a very exciting, you know, historically they would do GMO crops and test GMO crops when they were doing agriculture, but now half of the land is actually set up for organic farming for the community and it gives back all the surplus to the community. So it's a good victory, but you know, we're not, we're not letting 10 acres be enough. So that's just the update on Occupy the Farm. And it is also another example of how nonviolent, you know, direct action can get exhibits. So now we're gonna open it up into a little question and answer. Um, and we have about 20 minutes for that. So if anyone has any burning questions that they'd like to holler at us in the realm of sustainable communities or cannibal farms or the place or anything that we spoke about, these were, or that we didn't speak about. Please uh, open up. Get the mic. Who's got the mic? Oh. <laughs> okay, how about this? All at the same time, ask your question. One, two, three. Let's <laughs> Okay. Now that that's over, You can always come. Saturday. Every Saturday. Um, we have a, a work park there at Temple of Um and, um, and we have also um, some gatherings on Fridays. Um, we have, uh, well, you say Saturdays. So, so on Fridays, we, uh, well, by the way, in Casa de Paz, we, we never go out the door. And so and, um, we have an hour of receptive silence at 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. And on Fridays, we have a gathering where we uh, spend an hour in silence. And the next hour, we share a, a reading, inspiring reading to your permaculture, Cesar Chavez, or uh, San Suchi, or what is worth a minute. And then uh, we share a uh, meal after that. And, uh, so everyone is welcome to. And at the place every uh, second Saturday, we do a big uh, sort of a skill share, sustainability skill share. Uh, sometimes we do a barnyard bazaar with uh, different local crafters and um, you know, sort of uh, foodies, as well as at the end of the evening we do a hoedown loot hand, bluegrass and jug band music. And then the fourth Saturday we have a Get Her Done Day, which is a barn room. And so there's different projects. Tomorrow we're doing the hearth and garden. So that's the focus is the kitchen and the garden. So that's, and there's other things. Yes, yes. Our, our website is aplaceforsustainableliving.org. It's very long, but it, it works. A place for sustainable living. Try to use the mic as that much was... as possible so you get on the recording. Too. Oh, right. You want to get on the recording. The, and the question was is this all on our website? And, and what is your website? Could you expand, expand on the use 
uh, facts specifically as well as other um, foundational or temporary uh, earth-based dwelling structures. Um, second part of the question, having formerly lived out in the urban eco village in Eugene, Oregon, called the Kamaya Treya and Dharma Maya, do you have some affiliation and cooperation with um, our Northern Oregon uh, counterparts? Yeah, well, uh, one of the community members of the Vivas, a uh, brother in the last team that told him was Adela Jack. Uh, he started Castle Cross when we moved out close to four years ago, and he loves to be uh, outside. He's like, uh, why people only in like five star hotels when we have a 300 billion star hotel? <laughs> and so he must to sleep under the blankets of his stars. And so a sister that was living go with us at that time, Sister Dina, she went and actually she went and caught the poles and uh, with the whole uh, teepee there. So um, they were um, living there for, for a while. And yeah, it's just basically how do we reduce our violence footprint on the earth and how do we increase our love footprint at the same time. So now the teepee is it's not there anymore. She, in another uh, place right now. And uh, yeah, we're open to any community really. Like we have uh, people with uh, Christians and Muslims and Hindus and Jews and Native American and atheists and anybody you know come here with uh, no particular spiritual affiliation. Again, it's just like how do we are present and authentic that's kind of uh, our spirituality of your will. And so we're totally open to any sort of sister. Um, at the place we have a number of cob benches and that sand, straw, and clay is a natural building technique, which is create something that is as strong as concrete, um, but all natural uh, materials. At East Bay, we're very lucky to have clay-based soil, so we just harvest it on site, and then we add sand and straw. The straw is, creates a tensile strength, kind of like rebar on concrete. Without the straw, it, it breaks apart, so that's uh, cob. We have the cob oven, where we do our pizzas. We have an empanadas, and then we also have two, three cob benches outside. We have a cob bench inside, which is also a rocket mass heater. So the rocket stove has a stove pipe that goes throughout the bench, and it's like an L-shaped bench. So there's about 22 feet of stove pipe that's running through, and then goes out through the ceiling. Traditional stoves are about, uh, about 800, 900, 1,000 degrees of the coming out of the chimney, and that's all lost. So by sending it through this pipe, and it gets trapped in the um, bench itself, it stores it literally is a thermal battery. And so it will heat for hours, and then when the fire goes out, it stays warm for as uh, one hour for every inch thick. So ours is about six inches thick. So it goes out at midnight and it'll stay warm until 6 a.m. And then hopefully the sun's coming up and starting the warm process again. But that's what we have. We're also doing a tiny home um, uh, class on the 20th of February. It's only $100 if you sign up before the first. And all the other tiny home classes that we found are $300. Um, and so we're going to be doing a sort of a stick frame, a pallet, a uh, wall, and uh, uh, a common uh, straw bale on the outside as insulation. It's like serious thick R value without being um, poisonous uh, pink um, uh, glass insulation. So that straw bale tiny home class is a weekend, the Friday night into uh, all day Saturday, all day Sunday. Um, so we're going to be doing more natural building along the way. We've also done light straw clay, which is a, a basically if you have a, a standard frame wall and you need to insulate it, you can choose to do some kind of store-bought insulation, or you can put um, a straw into a, a, a bucket, a big garbage can of uh, clay water, and get it saturated, and you, and you put a piece of plywood up on the, the studs, and you pack it in there, and you tamp it down, and you pack more, and you tap it down, and then it dries for weeks. It has to take weeks to dry. But um, it also is a way that you get the straw insulation without having the, the straw band. So you're still within the two and a half or three and a half inch wall that a standard wall is, 
but you're using this uh, you know, light straw clay, um, is what they call it. Uh, so that's another technique. And we're exploring other uh, other other techniques, you know, the, the vertical wall and what have you, um, as, as just a form of, you know, that, that does act as insulation. We also have a um, living roof. And a living roof is basically, you know, you basically create a little lip and then you put two to five inches of soil. Now that two to five inches of soil is acting so you don't have to have insulation on the underside of the roof, you're, you're insulating the top side. And it's, it's growing, it's living, so it's another form of natural building. So thanks for that question. And I, we don't have any um, direct affiliation uh, outside of like the communities, there's a communities website, but um, we're very open. And the mycelial network that we're talking about for the Bay Area is most likely going to expand out as we get it rolling. And so similar to the for sure, yeah, we're, we're, we're planning one in, in May. A village building convergence, if you learn more about through Mark Blakeman's presentation, is a 10-day period where lots of projects are happening all over the city. People come from all over the world to, uh, to help build out these things so they can learn these techniques. But the end result is placemaking projects all over the, all over their city. And so one just happened in Sebastopol, which is north of uh, San Francisco, and so there's going to be sort of like these copycat type Stay tuned. Uh, I'm a uh, East Asian, but I was just wondering where the actual street uh, where Omni is like, located. No, it's um, Shattuck, right where Telegraph and Shattuck meet, like a block away. So it's 47th or something like this, 46, 47, and Shattuck. So it's a block off the main Temescal business district, um, and it's a block off the highway. 24 runs right behind. Um, but it has been vacant. Um, it was an Italian American uh, social club, and then it was a punk rock club, the Omni. Um, it's called the Omni, and uh, so it's it's got history. But for the last ten years, nothing has happened. Right,
you know, like thousands of people that care about it versus just 10 people. Um, it's a nonprofit part. You don't get funded in the first few years of having a nonprofit. It just doesn't happen. It used to be good ideas got funded. Not anymore. They have this whole ROI relationship, which is a return on investment. Even though you're not giving them money back, you have to give a guarantee that the shit's going to get done. And so, you know, because of that, nonprofits have to prove themselves. And so it's like the cart before the horse, and, you know, you know, which came clear, which came to the egg. What, what do you, how are you going to do that? Well, you've got to just do it. And then once you've done it, you say, hey, foundation, we've got this other idea for this other program. Would you fund it? Because we guarantee that it can get done because we've been doing it for the past three years. So that first four years, we've just been like kind of cruising and just doing. And now that we've done it, we have, um, in the past two years, we've actually written and gotten uh, three grants, small grants, but you know, we perceive that being part of the solution. But at no point are we relying on grants. We fund it through all the activities that happen, and there's a little bit of an entrepreneurial flavor, and there's a lot of bit of volunteerism, and that's how we pay the rent, and we are never going to get to a point where we are reliant on grants. If the grants happen, awesome. More programs happen, more things happen, but like, we don't want to get into the position where, oh, grant didn't happen, oh, can't pay rent, oh, got to move. Just briefly, um, in, in Casa Paz, what we're trying to do, the Casa Paz is one of the five houses of the reform, so we're trying to do a, an experiment of gift ecology. So myself, for the last seven years, I have lived without conventional currency. And in the house, we say, we, we just move here and we serve what we can. And then if the community supports you, great. And if the community doesn't support you, either we have to change or we're doing we need to change for the community. And so far, this team has been working with a lot of different combinations of people in the, um, in the community that uh, have been in other houses that want to be in this transition that well, not all of us could be, could be there. There's people that have family there. And so there's some grant uh, writing and other activities. But us as Council of we say we're going to remain into this ecology. Just tap into the needs and be with the neighbors. You know. Cry with them, eat with them, laugh with them. That's our currency. Love is a currency. Hopeful. Hopeful. Humble. 